I was using yesterday a verse from Second Chronicles chapter 16 and verse 9 that says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. And I was focusing on this and saying that God is looking throughout the entire earth. God is seeking for somebody who is wanting him more. That's what it's talking about when it's talking about whose heart is perfect. Nobody is sinless. Nobody is perfect in that sense. But this is just talking about a person who is totally committed to seeking God's best, who is wanting more. God is looking for this. God wants it more than you want it. You do not have to beg with God to reveal himself to you. God is begging with you today. You know, as it says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1, I beseech you. That means I beg you. I'm begging you by the mercies of God to present your body a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And don't be conformed to this world, but instead be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. God is begging us. He's seeking God wants you to succeed more than you want to succeed. Man, that is so powerful. That is awesome. Let me read the rest of this verse, though. I just talked about how his eyes are looking for those who are perfect in his sight or those who are completely his or committed to him. The rest of this verse says, Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. What is this talking about? Let me go back in this 16th chapter. And just for time's sake, I'm going to summarize some of this. But uh, the king right here, Asa, had gone out and he was being attacked by the king of Israel. Israel at this time had been split into two nations. There was the northern ten tribes that was called the nation of Israel. And then the southern two tribes was called the nation of Judah. And Judah, Asa was the king of Judah, and he was under attack from the king of Israel. And the king of Israel had come down, and in a strategic place, he had started building a town to cut off all avenues of supply towards the king of Judah, and he was going to besiege Judah, and he was going to take Judah and conquer them. So here was King Asa in a bad situation. He was outnumbered. He was uh, was just in a situation that in the natural, he wasn't going to win. So what he did, he stripped all of the gold all of the silver, not only his personal wealth, but the wealth of the temple. And he took all of this stuff and he sent it to the king of Syria, to Benadad, the king of Syria. And he made a league with him, a, a you know, a treaty and said, there's a treaty between us. I'm going to hire the, I'm going to give you all of this if you will just come and attack the king of Israel so that he will quit fighting with me. So the king of Syria obeyed. He went and attacked the northern part of the kingdom of Israel. And because of that, the king of Israel had to leave off his siege of Judah. And so Asa won a battle without ever firing a shot, without ever losing a life. He just basically hired this other nation to come and attack his enemy. And because of it, his enemy had to withdraw. So you know what? Most people would think, what's wrong with that? He won. He got what he wanted. He got the king of Israel to lead him along, and he didn't lose a life. All he lost was some money out of it. So that is the background. But look at this. It says in verse 7, and it says, At that time Hanai the seer came to Asa king of Judah and said unto him, Because thou hast relied on the king of Syria and not relied on the Lord thy God, Therefore is the host of the king of Syria escaped out of thine hand. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thy hand. Now to get this, you have to go back into the previous uh, couple of chapters into uh, Second Chronicles chapter 14. It says in verse 8, And Asa had an army of men that bare targets and spears out of Judah, 300,000, and out of Benjamin that bare shields and drew bows, 204,000. So altogether, that's 580,000 
uh, soldiers he had, and it says that all these were mighty men of valor. And there came out against them Zerah the Ethiopian with a host of a thousand thousand and three hundred chariots and came to Maresha. Did you know that this means that he had over a million soldiers? So they were outnumbered nearly two to one. But look what happened. It says, Then Asa went out against him, and they set the battle in array in the valley of uh, whatever those places are. And verse 11, it says, And Asa cried unto the Lord his God and said, Lord, it is nothing with thee to help, whether with many or with them that have no power. Help us, O Lord our God, for we rest on thee, and in thy name we go against this multitude. O Lord, thou art our God. Let not man prevail against thee. So the Lord smote the Ethiopians before Asa and before Judah, and the Ethiopians fled. And the Asa and the people that were with him pursued them unto Gerar, and the Ethiopians were overthrown that they could not recover themselves, for they were destroyed before the Lord and before his host, and they carried away very much spoil. And it goes on to talk about how that they fought all of these cities and won. But this is what the prophet was speaking to Asa over here in the 16th chapter. Go back again to verse 8. Were not the Ethiopians and the Lubims a huge host with very many chariots and horsemen? Yet because thou didst rely on the Lord, he delivered them into thine hand. And then he says this verse that I use. For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in behalf of those whose heart is perfect towards him. Herein thou hast done foolishly, therefore from henceforth thou shalt have wars. So this is the context of this. Asa had actually won a victory, not by uh, fighting, not by the loss of any life. He took all of the gold and the silver and he gave it to the king of Syria. The king of Syria attacked his enemy and his enemy withdrew. Most people would say, well, that's what you wanted. And you got peace. Without having to lose any life, this was good. But the prophet came and said, no, you have done foolishly. And he goes on and says that uh, he was going to deliver the Syrians into his hands. In other words, he obtained the goal. He got out of the battle and out of the strait that he was in, but he didn't do it God's way. And God told him that if you would have depended upon me, I not would have only overcome the king of Israel, but I would have overcome the king of Syria. You would have conquered all of this. Instead of you losing all of your gold and silver, you would have still won the battle, and you'd have not only won that battle, but you would have conquered the nation of Syria. God's plans were better than this. In other words, here's another way of saying this. Asa got something that worked, but it wasn't God's best. He settled for less. And, you know, most people will sit there and say, well, I, you know, just as long as I have a nice house, as long as my needs are provided, as long as my needs are taken care of, that's all I want. There is a right and a wrong way to accomplish these ends. The end does not justify the means. Asa got what he wanted. He got out of a battle, but he didn't do it God's way. And because of it, God actually rebuked him. And I'm saying this to you in the name of the Lord, but there are some of you that because of your hard work and you may be a person who loves God and because you sought the Lord to a degree, you may have reached a level to where you are okay, you're surviving, you may not be everything, but you know, you just reached a place to where it's not like you're drowning, it's not like you're in a crisis situation, but it's not good, it's not what you want, but it's just okay. And you've settled for this. But I'm telling you, God has something more. And as I go further into this, I'm not going to really spend today's program, but this week I'm going to talk about that, like in the area of finances, that there are people who you live in a nice house, you've got a nice car, you've got things, your needs are provided, but you are in debt up to your eyeballs. That is not God's best. And I know that right there, I've just shocked people. I can hear television sets all around the world clicking off or changing channels. Because, see, people just don't want to hear it. Well, I don't care how I got that. I've, I've, I'm in debt, sure, and I've done all of these things, but I'm living okay. Did you know that's not God's best? 
I'm not saying that God's against any, anybody. God's not against you if you owe money. I'm just saying it's not God's best. You know, my wife and I, we rented for many, many, many years because we knew that God's best was to be debt free. So we were believing God for a place debt free. And uh, we would rent. And I remember this one place we rented in Colorado Springs that we rented it. It wasn't the best house we could find, but we rented it specifically because a military couple said that, uh, you know, Colorado Springs has Fort Carson and, a, and an Air Force um, uh, academy and a lot of different military installations. And this was a military guy who had come to Colorado Springs because he was stationed there. He had now gone somewhere else. And he was six years away from retirement, and he told us, he says, oh, I want a renter that's going to be here for six years. And, man, that's what we wanted because we were we would rent and they would, you know, sell the house or do something. So, anyway, we were looking for a long-term deal. He says, I'm going to rent this for six years, and we thought, we'll take it. It wasn't the best house, but it was a good one, and we thought that because it was for six years, it was great. So we rented it. Within six months of us renting that house, he decided he was going to take early retirement and come back, and we had to move out. So we were only there just a, we were there less than a year. And finally, even though we knew that God's best wasn't to go in debt, I knew it wasn't best for us to have to move every six months either. And so we eventually uh, used my VA loan, and I bought a house, and I started making payments. But and here's my point in saying all of this. God wasn't mad at me because of that. I, it was a decision I made, and God wasn't mad at me. He still loved me, but we never accepted that as being God's best. We started making double payments. We started getting out of debt just as quickly as we could. We weren't condemned. God wasn't mad at us, but I knew that there was something better then making double payments. Did you know that when you buy anything on credit, a house, a car, anything that you buy on credit, by the time you add the interest in, you're going to pay for that thing nearly twice what it's worth. You know, if you would stop and think about this logically, that is not a good business decision. I mean, why would you pay for something twice what it's worth? It's because people want the convenience of having it right now. They don't want to wait. You know, if you were to go and buy a used car, something that would work, it may not be have all the bells and whistles. It may not smell new, but you can go buy a can for a dollar and spray that new car smell in your car. If you would just cool your emotions and go buy something that you could afford that was that was functional, but it just didn't have all the bells and whistles, and then you begin to start putting aside the money that you would pay for a car payment, you put aside $400, $500 a month or whatever it is. Did you know in four years or five years, you could go buy you a brand new car debt free and avoid all of the interest? And I can guarantee you, when you go buy a car and you have cash for it, they will come down in the price. Boy, you can work a deal. You can save thousands of dollars doing that. But most people will not shoot for God's best. They are content. There are many of you watching this program, especially younger people, that you've grown up with a debt mentality. You know, I was just talking to some of our people who are working in our school now. They're from Norway and they came over here and they're in the process of buying a house. And they, they said that in Norway, people don't buy houses on credit. They buy them cash. They buy something that they can afford. It's, they said it's a total different mindset than what Americans have. Americans' credit has become so easy that we mortgage our future. And again, I'm not condemning anybody. I, I've used this example that Jamie and I went in debt because we finally figured that, you know, being renting where you're kicked out every six months because the landlord changes his mind, that wasn't total freedom either. And so we did go in debt, but we got it paid off in less than 15 years. We paid off a 30-year mortgage in less than 15 years because we realized that making all of this interest wasn't God's best. And I forget now how much we say, but we we saved, I don't even know, it was certainly tens of thousands of dollars. It could have been over $100,000 that we would have paid in interest over that 30-year loan that we saved. 
And now that we've got our house paid off, we've got our cars paid off, the only time we use a credit card is for like gas or something. We pay it off at the end of the month and we don't owe any man anything. And I'm telling you, that's God's best. So I'm saying all of this because see, Asa, he got what he wanted, but he didn't do it God's way. And because of it, he lost the victory over the Syrians that he would have had. And some people say, well, he got what he wanted, but he settled for less than God's best. And he got upset. Let me also read this. Right after this prophet had said this to Asa, look at this in verse 10. It says, then Asa was wroth with the seer and put him in prison house, for he was in a rage with him because of this thing. And Asa oppressed some of the people at the same time. Did you know the king got mad at the prophet? for speaking these things into his life. He got what he wanted, and how dare him? You know, he it worked out. I know that there are some of you right now that are upset with me because I've challenged the American dream about get all you can, can all you get, and sit on your can, and pay interest, and pay for it twice, mortgage your future. You know, the United States government, and not only the United States, but most governments are in debt. They're hocked up to their ears. We have run up such a debt in the United States that it will be impossible to pay for it if there aren't major, major changes made. And our government, from the government on down, from the highest level to the lowest level, it, they just embrace debt. They're mortgaging their future. This is against what God's Word says. It is not God's best. Does that mean that God hates America? No. Does that mean that God hates you if you're in debt? No. But it's not God's best. And did you know what? As long as you can tolerate that situation, you will. You are going to have to get sick and tired of being in debt. You're going to have to get to where you resent paying twice what something is worth because you can't exercise any patience and believe God and trust God. And so you just mortgage your future. You know, there's people watching this program right now that you live in a house, you drive cars, you have CDs and televisions and and the fanciest phone and the fanciest clothes and you are living the life but you are mortgaged so much that if there was a downturn if you were to be laid off your world would come crashing down around you we've seen this with the you know the housing market how that man credit was so easy people were getting into houses that they couldn't afford just paying it out and then the first time that there's a bump in the economy If you get laid off, we saw a huge increase in foreclosures, houses being repossessed and stuff because people were living beyond their means, paying for things on credit. This is not the way that God intended. And there are people watching this program right now that honestly, you're getting ready to go to work. Some of you are right now. And you are having to work two jobs, husband and wife, both working, farming your children out to somebody else to raise because you are living way beyond your means. You are under stress. You're under pressure. There's things going on in your life. It's affecting your health. It's affecting your marriage. And yada, 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 on and on. And you could go just these things because we aren't looking for God's best. We are taking the world system of getting whatever we want right now, and we don't even think about the future. We don't think about that we're paying for this thing twice what it's worth. And because of it, you're causing a lot of stress, a lot of problems. That's not God's best. And I know some of you right now, your whole life is geared this direction. It's like you may even agree, and the Holy Spirit may be bearing witness with what I'm saying, but you have created a monster that now you've got to feed all of this debt and all of these payments. You know, since my wife and I have gotten out of debt, I don't even know, it's been 15 years or something like that, it doesn't take very much money to live if you don't have a house payment, if you don't have a car payment, if you aren't paying off credit cards, if you aren't buying things on credit, it doesn't take very much money. You would be shocked If you weren't paying so much interest and paying for everything twice what it's worth, you would be shocked at how you could live with much, much, much less money. But see, we have not even shot for God's best. And I know some of you think, well, why do you think being debt-free is God's best? On tomorrow's program, 
I'll go into more detail and I'll give you scriptures. But there's a many scriptures that talk about that God doesn't want us to be in debt. That is not the counsel that God's Word gives. And yet the vast majority of even Christians do not use God's Word as a standard. They aren't, I mean, this isn't even a goal. There are many of you watching this program right now that what I'm saying, you don't, you don't care about this. You are just absolutely content paying for everything twice what it's worth. And, he, and you're fine with that. Did you know what? You'll never experience being debt free as long as you can tolerate debt. You're going to have to get to a place where you change your goals. Again, I'm not condemning you, but I'm saying you shouldn't be content to live in this world system. You may have to use it. You may have to get started in in this system, but man, you ought to get out of it. You ought to be doing things. There's things you can do to change this situation, but it will not change until you get tired, uh, sick and tired of paying debt and living below God's standard. Man, this is awesome what I'm sharing. I know this is uh, just like many of you are just like Asa was with this prophet. Man, you are mad at the messenger. There's some of you that are mad at me, but can you disagree with it? Can you look at the Word of God and say that it encourages debt, that this is God's system? If you'd be honest, you'd have to say no. And yet, you just continually do it. There's some of you right now that you're considering going in debt. Man, I'd encourage you not to do it if there's any way around it. And even if for what some reason you find yourself in that situation, it ought to be like Proverbs chapter 6 says, if you have found yourself in debt, go deliver yourself as a bird that's been caught in a trap, as an animal that's about to be killed by a hunter. The borrower is servant to the lender. You need to get out of that situation just as quickly as you can. Don't be condemned. God's not mad at you. I'm not mad at you, but I'm saying it's not God's best. And as long as you can settle for less than God's best, you will. Get out of it. Change it.